Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Eldon Taylor. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. The next two hours are devoted to learning something more, not just about the world of shoes and chips and sealing wax, but about how, what, and why we believe as we do. A time for the open-minded, willing to challenge some of those old ideas behind what we think we know, who we are, and who we might just become. I'm Eldon Taylor, and this is Provocative Enlightenment. All right, our chat room is open, and my partner Ravinder awaits you there now. You can log on by going to Provocative Enlightenment dot com forward slash chat we do have a special chat room so Ravinder tell us all about it please we do have a marvelous chat room with a great group of people but today I think we may be having some technical issues with the chat room so if you can't get in right away keep checking back because we are looking into it uh, that is as we said provocative enlightenment dot com forward slash chat Get technical issues in the chat room. Is yeah. that what blew my computer up? No, no, huh? not, not my fault. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So the chat room's now up? I think so. Okay. I think so. As I said, if anyone has any issues, you know, just keep trying. Actually, it's coming up really slow, and I don't know why. So huh. we're looking right. into it. We'll see what we can do, but just be patient and come on in and say hello. All right, this week's Spotlight is all about animal consciousness. How timely, considering our guest today. I recently posted a new study on Facebook that announced, quote, dogs hear our words and how we say them, close quote. The article summarized its findings this way. When people hear another person talking to them, they respond not only to what is being said, those consonants and vowels strung together in words and sentences, but also to other features of that speech, the emotional tone, the speaker's gender, uh, etc. Now, a report provides some first evidence of how dogs also differentiate and process those various components of human speech. The study design evaluated how dogs processed information comparable to humans. Previous research has shown that dogs do process information hemispherically. Lead researcher Victoria Ratcliffe of the School of Psychology at the University of Sussex explained the findings this way, quote, This is particularly interesting because our results suggest that the processing of speech components in the dog's brain is divided between the two hemispheres in a way that is actually very similar to the way it is separated in the human brain. Of course, it doesn't mean that dogs actually understand everything that we humans might say or that they have a human-like ability of language, far from it, but these results support the idea that our canine companions are paying attention, not only to who we are and how we say things, but also to what we say. All of this should come as good news to any of us who happen to have a dog since we spend a considerable amount of time talking to them. They may not understand everything that we're saying, but they're definitely listening. Dogs are not the only animals who appear to understand language, and it's not limited to understanding human language, as many animals also possess their own language. Prairie dogs, for example, have their own vocabulary and even distinguish between the approach of a female or male human, what color clothing they're wearing, or whether or not they are carrying a gun. Dolphins are known to have a very large and complex vocabulary, and some animal, animals are able to learn human language. For example, the late African gray parrot, Alex, not only learned human language, he consistently provided the correct answer to questions put to him in that language. Animals are capable of moral decisions as well. Experiments with Mac monkeys... Bonobos and other animals have repeatedly demonstrated this. Indeed, Dr. Franz DeWall explained his work on this show, and his research demonstrates that moral behavior does not begin and end with religion, but is in fact a product of evolution, and as such, a behavior found among many animals. In one study carried out by Drs. Carl Sagan, and Andrewian, we learn the following as quoted from their book, Shadows of Forgotten Ancestors. Quote, 
In the annals of primate ethics, there are some accounts that have the ring of parable. In a laboratory setting, macaws were fed if they were willing to pull a chain and electrically shock an unrelated macaw whose agony was in plain view through a one-way mirror. Otherwise, they starved. After learning the ropes, the monkeys frequently refused to pull the chain. In one experiment, only 13% would do so. 87% preferred to go hungry. One macaw went without food for nearly two weeks rather than hurt its fellow. Macaws who had themselves been shocked in previous experiments were even less willing to pull the chain. The relative social status or gender of the macaws had little bearing on their reluctance to hurt others. Close quote. For that matter, animals understand the concept of social contracts, possess the ability to use tools, are self-aware, and even understand the notion of death. This last one is evidenced by elephants who stop when encountering the skeleton of friends and appear to mourn. I personally know that animals understand language however they do it. I've had the great pleasure of enjoying very special relationships with horses, dogs, cats, goats, parrots, even a bull calf. I could share many stories with you, but let me tell you just about a couple. We had a raccoon come in and begin killing our chickens. One morning, my German shepherd, Balto, began barking at the back patio door while I was sipping my first cup of coffee. I went to the glass door, and there I saw the largest coon I've ever seen. I quickly grabbed my shotgun and opened the door, whereupon Balto rushed out to grab the coon. The coon weighed some 45 pounds, and instead of running, turned to face Balt. Gripping the balcony railing, it stood its ground, striking out at Balt with its inch-and-a-half-long claws. Balt was blocking my shot, so I yelled the command, Break away! Out of instinct! And Balt did just that, providing the shot that removed the coon and ended the chicken kills. This was a command that I had never used before anywhere with any animal. How do you think Balto understood what to do? Recently, my pretty bride informed me that a skunk had taken up residency in her chicken house. Skunks are notorious egg raiders, and they kill any chicken that gets in their way. I looked in her chicken house, and sure enough, there in one of the nesting boxes was a large skunk. So I decided to try to get it to leave by throwing some mothballs into the coop as close to the skunk as possible. Daringly, what I won't do for my bride. (laughs) I then closed the chicken house door and waited for it to leave. A couple of hours later, and the skunk had not moved. So this time, I reluctantly informed the skunk that I did not want to have to kill it, but if it did not leave, I was going to have to shoot it. I well remember feeling very sad about needing to kill this beautiful animal, and I do believe that the skunk understood me. Nobody likes to have to kill an animal. I then went to the house to get a gun since it was getting dark and time was running out. Obviously, the chickens were not going in for the night. Instead, they were nervously hanging around the chicken house. We have predators aplenty around our ranch, so allowing them to stay out during the evening wasn't an option. It took less than five minutes to load my weapon and return to the chicken house where I found the skunk had exited. Coincidence? I think not, but you can decide. Your thoughts on this, Ravinder? Oh, I think animals are really special. That particular research that you just uh, told us all about, that was, I thought that was horrible. You know, trying to get um, the monkeys to zap their friends I yeah I had an objection to that one but you know it doesn't surprise me that animals are very much aware I think you have a whole range of intelligence in animals just like you have a range of intelligence in humans too and some people are just or some animals are just more alert than others and some people are more asleep than others so it doesn't surprise me you know, I, I said something that kind of, you know, slipped, I guess. There are people that apparently do like just to kill animals. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I said uh, no one likes to kill. And, you know, I, I suppose what I meant is, you know, there's no way in the world that that's something I want to do. But living in the country as we do, there are times and places where you really don't have any choice. 
maybe our guest today can shed some light on that. I think it's about prioritizing, because you're right, being in the country, you have to prioritize between the family, which can extend to my hens, because they're my my little flock out well, there. They all have names, and you they do cry your eyes out when you lose one. I do, you know, and you know, I have exactly the same thing. I don't want to have to kill anything, but there are there is a hierarchy of family, and so you know, we protect our children the most, our pets, but have the chickens come into the into the family fold, and so yeah, sometimes you have to do what you have to do. Okay. Moving on. Every week I read some of your letters as our way of paying respect to the very important role you play in making this show successful. Our last live show featured Sandra Ann Taylor, and we discussed her newest book, Your Quantum Breakthrough Code. Terry wrote, this was a great show. I haven't been able to listen for a long while, but so glad this was the one I caught. Love your discussion on the law of attraction and Sandra's explanation that it isn't the thoughts we think, but the energy those thoughts create. Actually, it's the energy we put behind those thoughts. Maybe it's both. Going on. Also, teenage boys and tapping for sex. Ha, ha, ha. (laughs) You remember that? That was pretty good. Yeah, okay. That is the guaranteed proof that the law of attraction doesn't work. (laughs) Oh, no, no, no. This was about tapping. If you could tap for wealth, you know, imagine all the teenage boys out there tapping for sex. Oh, wow. We've got it both ways. (laughs) So, anyway, her letter continues. I was thinking, too that whether or not there is a difference between her coding and tapping, or even if they are essentially the same thing, it is like diets. One size doesn't fit all or work for everyone. Most likely the same with this. Some people may resonate with tapping, while some people may resonate with the third eye coding. Thanks for being you, Eldon, and sharing you, Ravinder and Sandra, with the world today. CB remarked, fun to hear more in-depth in personalities. Love the freedom the two-hour format gives Eldon to get into details too hard to chase in an hour. Annie wrote, so pumped that your show is now two hours. I was always wanting more at the end of one hour. BG wrote, I love your program and your great guests. Now, on Thanksgiving evening, uh, I joined George Nury on Coast to Coast AM, and we spoke about the power of gratitude. It's a great way to spend Thanksgiving evening, in my view, other than the fact that it was midnight. And But... Randall wrote, Eldon, I just caught the last part of your interview on Coast to Coast. Thank you for following the call of your life, for your bravery to go forward when probably most everything you knew was telling you that you were crazy. It was. It has always been the crazy people who have changed the world. Our thoughts are so important. Don't grin at me. I know you <laughs> think I'm crazy. But Danny, I love you crazy and all. Oh, uh, lucky me. Danny wrote, Dear Eldon, I heard your interview on Coast to Coast AM, and I was so enlightened by your spirit. Patty wrote, it was wonderful to hear you last night on Coast to Coast. I am a negative person, and I have been my whole life, but I will start to change that around. I started my journal, as you suggested this morning, and will count what I have. It will be work for me, but I am up to the task. I have been given a lot on my plate, but I am grateful to have a plate. Great for you, Patty. Vicki wrote, thank you for the most exquisitely excellent interview and sharing on Coast to Coast I am. You are filled to the brim with common sense and amazing insights. Magnanimously multiplied blessings and miracles to you forever and always. Wow. Well, thank you, Vicki. That's really nice. Roxanne wrote, love your show. I love all your programs and listen again and again. For me, you are simply the best. I totally believe in your CDs. I have purchased some in the past, and they have really worked. Jeff wrote, I enjoy the subjects you share and the books you have written, all a rich resonance of reassurance for my many experiences. I have always had a knowing without knowing and would unintentionally unsettle my friends with my predictions, which would happen in front of their eyes. Also, with my work as an intensive care paramedic, I have had the privilege of experiencing both the first breath and last breath of fellow spirits and everything else in between, including out-of-body resuscitations. Anyway, keep being the being you are. Well, thanks, Jeff, and I'll do just that, even if my wife thinks I'm crazy. Angelica wrote, discuss your programs with the police as they are first in line with the mentally ill and a huge heroin drug overdose problem often started with prescription drugs. My orthopedic surgeon and his staff also agreed that your CDs work better for me with pain management than the morphine pump. Thanks for your work. It's amazing. Well, thank you, all of you, for your feedback. I genuinely appreciate hearing from every one of you. 
Okay, that's all the time we're going to take for letters today, but I do invite you to opine by sending your comments to Eldon at EldonTaylor.com or by joining me on Facebook. Now to this week's show, Animal Wisdom with Dr. Linda Bender. How is it that pets are able to travel thousands of miles through unknown territory to reunite with their beloved humans? How can dogs detect cancer with up to a 98% accuracy rate and foresee epileptic or diabetic seizures in their owners? How do animals seem to know an earthquake is coming long before the world's best seismologists? In the wonderful book, and it is a great read, Animal Wisdom, veterinarian and animal advocate Linda Bender offers a wealth of amazing stories and research-based evidence indicating animals have deeply perceptive, even extrasensory abilities. I'm going to take a minute to plug this book. I'm going to tell you what, if you love animals and you don't have this book in your library, you're cheating yourself. It is a great book. It, it You actually get goosebumps reading some of it. All right. During her 14 years, or I, I should, during the 14 years that Dr. Bender spent living in Europe, Asia, Africa, and Middle East, her veterinary work included the rescue, rehabilitation, and protection of wildlife. Her interest in spirituality and healing led her to found Mind the Gap Wellness Center, as well as a pet therapy program. She is a certified practitioner of Energy for Life and is a co-founder of the nonprofit organization From the Heart. So on that, let's get her in here. Welcome to Provocative Enlightenment, Dr. Linda Bender. Dr. Bender, are you there? Here. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Yes. Great to be (laughs) with you. Thank you. Good. You know, we like to get three objectives accomplished with our guest. Who is the messenger, what is the message, and how do we use it? So please begin by telling us a little bit about your background. What sort of youngster were you? I mean, were you raised religious? Did you have pets? And if so, did you lose one? And did that lead you to believe animals had a spirit? And so on and so forth. In other words, who were you as a child? Yes. Well, uh, about, you know, I've been speaking on the sacred relationship between humans and animals for a number of years. And a woman came up to me several years ago and asked me, what was it like before? You know, when did you first start connecting with animals? And I thought for a minute, and frankly, I had no answer for this woman. And I thought, and I thought, because I could not come up with a time before, um, You know, no conversion moment came to mind. So I thought about it for quite some time, and I came up with a story when I was a a kid. I grew up in New Jersey in a suburban uh, neighborhood, but we had a a farm and a woods behind the house. So I was called Nature Girl by my dad because I was more comfortable out in the woods with the animals than I was indoors with the humans and a story came to mind though of when i was a kid gosh about six actually it's they ended up putting it in the beginning of my book because they wanted it there um i was awoken about 2 a.m in the morning and heard this non-human screaming voice woke my parents we went outside with a uh, a flashlight, and there on the second tier up on the lawn was a tiny little bunny. And the bunny was shaking in terror. Mom was nowhere around. It had had some kind of near-death experience. And I scooped that bunny up in my arms, and I decided, I'm going to save this bunny. I'm going to take it inside the house. I'm going to stay up all night and, and hold it in my arms. So we went in the kitchen, and Uh, I held the bunny up to my heart so it could hear and feel my breathing and heartbeat. And as I did so, I remember distinctly feeling a connection, and a connection between me and that tiny little bunny, and the connection just swirled with so much love and so much connectedness. I had no words or understanding other than on some level I knew that love was this experience and there was something much bigger going on uh, running the show and I remember that moment as an immediate connection to all life and that all life is sacred and precious 
deserves love and respect, and it's never left me. Wow. Uh, what happened to the bunny? Uh, see, the, I, I said I was going to stay up all night, and of course I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I fell asleep, but the bunny was still there in the morning, and perhaps that was my first experience of love heals, um, because the uh, immense love that was between us, gratitude. And I felt gratitude, too, because it was at that moment when I understood for the first time in my young life that healing that bunny healed me and taking care of that bunny made sense of my life. And the bunny went out in the wild the next day. Mm, interesting. Gerald Jampolsky's Attitude and Healing Center says, uh, when you go to the aid to another, um, you could be in intractable pain and the pain disappears. Yeah. When you're helping someone else, uh, the body seems to be bathed with its natural you know, opiates, and um, and that promotes healing. That promotes wellness. So, absolutely. Uh, so, l- let me ask you this now: How old were you then? Oh gosh, about six. About six. Okay. So, but prior to that, you obviously you feel that you've always had this connection with animals. Uh, yeah, you know, and my that's first why you had the experiences were actually out with animals, and you know, at the time, I mean, I. <laughs> I wasn't raised in a conscious family, you know. There were no such words as meditation, consciousness, being awake. None of that existed, you know. We went to church on Sunday at uh, the Presbyterian Church, and Presbyterians do meetings very well, but they're not, you know, (laughs) touchy-feely. No, you know, actually, they kind of interpret Genesis rather literally as dominion over the animals, do they not? Well, this is where we get into big trouble. It's more a, um, I would say as Presbyterians, and the reason I say we have meetings is we we tend to take a more intellectual look Uh um, at life. And I think it's more the Catholics who uh, came up with the whole dominion theory. But, you know, it's it's organized religion. Yeah. uh, it I don't know. I mean, I, if I talk to my Methodist friends, they tell me they're the intellect. Everybody passes that one around. But, but the bottom line is, I guess what I was getting to is, you were raised a meat eater. Is that true? I was. My my parents ate meat, um, but I have to say that as well that I never wanted to eat meat. You know, I never, and I finally gave up eating meat um, when I was twenty one. I was out on my own, and I went through a whole you know, rehashing of what health and, and life was all about. I've always had, I've had that desire my whole life, and I attribute it to the animals, the spiritual, mystical path, and health. What is health and wellness? It's been with me forever. Um, and so I never skipped a beat. You know, I stopped eating meat and never, never even thought about it again. I used to be called in my later, you know, on from there that, <laughs> that, uh, vegetarian veterinarian weirdo <laughs> my housing has changed <laughs> <laughs> okay so you you anticipated my my question about vegetarianism today you are a vegetarian and that is out of respect to animals well it's it's of course because well, it, it isn't only respect for animals, because, of course, it is. Because for many years I've been saying what's going on in the food animal industry is, is it's just, it was bad, and now it's All right. I, I, I asked you a, a, a big question yeah, when we're short time. Yeah, it's unsustainable. When we but, come back, we're going to pick it up from where we are, okay, all right? We'll, right? we'll talk about you know, the food industry, et cetera. But we have a heartbreak, and I don't want the computer to kick us out. We're speaking okay. with Dr. Linda Bender about her life, work, and her new book, Animal Wisdom, Learning from the Spiritual Lives of Animals. You can learn more about her by visiting lindabender.org. That's B-E-N-D-E-R dot org. Remember to join Ravinder and her team in the chat room. You can do that by going to provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. Do stay tuned. We'll be right back. You're listening to Provocative Enlightenment with Elton Taylor. Ravinder and I love supporting causes we believe in. We both feel the pain when we see an animal abused. Call it empathy or what you will, the pain is very real. 
We both also celebrate with joy the wonderful stories of animal rehabilitation. Indeed, it can be goosebump time. We urge you to get involved and lend aid to your local animal shelter or in the alternative, make your donations to the Humane Society of the United States. You can read about their work and make that donation by going to www.humanesociety.org. You can make a difference, but only if you act. Thank you. Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Eldon Taylor. Welcome back. If you just joined us, we're chatting with Dr. Linda Bender about her life, work, and new book, Animal Wisdom, Learning from the Spiritual Lives of Animals. Now we ask our guests for up to three songs, songs that have some special significance to them. Music can and does elicit deeply emotional states of being, and in many ways it is a great tool of self-disclosure, for our favorite music can say a lot about who we are. So now... We just played Over the Rainbow by Eva Cassidy. Why is this one special to you, Dr. Bender, and how does it tell us about whom you are? Oh, well, I'm so thrilled that you incorporated music because music is such an inspiration, and it's such a simple way to pull us into a deeper consciousness that we share with all life, and that's what happened to me when I was a child. That song, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, was my mother's favorite song. And she used to play it often. And I remember hearing that song and connecting with the birds outside and the birds flying up in the sky. And birds invited me into their world and explained to me so much more beyond words of the beauty and the sacredness of life. And what that evolved into over the years is when an animal crossed over when an animal died, um, I invented this place, and it was called Rainbow Bend. 
and it was inspired mm-hmm. by that song. And it's a real live uh, heaven, and all beings go there, and birds fly, and elephants run, and abused dogs uh, run in love and free. So it's a place where all sacred life gathers for me, and it existed then, and it exists very much so today. Interesting. Are you, you must be familiar with the Rainbow Bridge poem. Yes, of course. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I, I've never thought about, you know, it being a corollary to somewhere over the rainbow, but it's so perfect, isn't it? It yes. is. I hadn't thought of that either. Yeah. Well, well I it's... thought of it as a child, and it works for me. And it actually, and in my coursework and in my workshops, I always have people... We go into uh, our own sacred space and we create one. We create a sacred space because everyone has the ability to come up with their own unique sacred space. And it's such a blessed way to invite all life there, whether they're on this side of the, you know, of uh, incarnated or crossed over. It's just, it's, it's such a joyous way to connect with all life. All right. Before the break, I had just asked you if you were a vegetarian out of respect to animals, and you were yes. explaining that that was true, but you had a, were about, to, I think, to launch into discussion regarding uh, how animals are harvested, the food industry. Right. Well, you pick it up. Sure, I'll, I can. You know, I could go on and on, but let me just say this. And I talk, I speak a lot about this in my book, and I also speak of the prey predator relationship. And prey predator relationship is so misunderstood by humans in in our society and Western culture. Uh, I spend enough time all over the world, you know, in the trenches with animals, wildlife, and I understand more deeply what the more sacred giving and receiving uh, of prey predator means. It's life, life giving life. There cannot be any life without death. And we are part of that. We are animals. We humans are animals, and we're part of that prey predator relationship. And we tend to be frightened when we see it in the wild, but we should be most frightened of all of what we do to our own uh, prey animals. And that has been what's going on uh, behind closed doors, and it's getting more so. There are 19 states now who've passed uh, a gag laws, which means it's against the law to go in and expose cruelty um, in slaughterhouses. Uh, Paul McCartney once said, if slaughterhouses had glass walls, no one would eat meat. Um, but the point is this. Of course, I recommend a vegetarian diet, and it is, in the future, probably the only really sustainable way for the planet and for humans to to exist. But what we do to animals, we do to ourselves. And from a scientific, you know, a veterinary point of view, we're pumping these animals full of antibiotics, hormones. Their bodies are so riddled with stress uh, hormones and from the abuse. And when you eat the flesh of that animal, all the bad things, all the toxins that is in that animal's body becomes part of your body when you eat it. And that's not my opinion. That's just physiology. It is what it is. So what we do to animals, we do to ourselves. So that's a whole issue aside from I couldn't eat meat because when I look at it, I think of the cruelty. Before you leave that, though, let, let me ask you something. I was going to ask you about that, uh, what we do to ourselves uh, question anyway, what we do to animals, we do to ourselves. Years ago, uh, Dr. Bender, I participated in a uh, study Mark Thurston carried out through the Association of Research and Enlightenment. Oh, I love Edgar, them. Good. Yes. What, 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 Edgar Casey, one of Edgar Casey's readings suggested that because of the way animals were killed, they, uh, you know, they were treated in such a horrible way that that they were full of fear, and yes. you know, fear is a chemical. It's Absolutely. A, okay, and that this fear, uh, and sometimes the accompanying, because when there is a fear, there's always an anger response. At least that is, you know, we kick up the adrenaline to run or to retaliate. Um, 
that when we when we eat these animals, that we're actually taking that chemical soup into our bodies, and that as a result, it increases our hostility, our aggression, um, and, and our own fear. So the idea behind this study was to go meat less for 30 days. And at the time, I was a meat eater, you know, and uh, and I participated in this study. And, I, you know, there was a, pre, a, a before and a, an after, but it wasn't... Uh, you know, the best psychological instrument, so I'm not going to call it all that scientific. It was a self-appraisal. Nevertheless, uh, my own self-appraisal, and and so there's, you know, context here. At the time, I was a practicing criminalist, carried a gun, ran lie detection uh, tests every day, was involved in investigations and things of that nature. So it wasn't uncommon for me to be dealing with, you know, that whole emotional set. Yes. My own self-appraisal at the end of 30 days was significantly um, important to me. It, there was a great decrease in the amount of anger or hostility that I naturally felt inclined to based on this uh, self-appraisal that uh, Thurston sent us. And again, that wasn't a, it wasn't a psychometric instrument, but it was a, a valuable piece of self-appraisal. So I'm not putting this forth as science. I am asking you now, though, for your opinion. Do, when we eat animals that are slaughtered the way they are, and of course we all know when they're fed the way they are, harvested the way they are, all of, all of that we're ingesting, but do we also get this other chemical soup, in your opinion? I do. And that's part of the physiology, because not only are we we getting that soup that you're just saying, we're getting the byproducts of it, and that's when that's the um, the hormones that are produced from that state, and they're real, and they are produced, and they're in the animal's body, and that becomes part of our own body. So all of that, absolutely, in my many years of experience, is 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 what happens. How can it be otherwise? How can it be otherwise? No, I concur, you know, and I was a rancher and I had a cattle ranch and I uh, I have been to the slaughter yards and they, they will forever change your opinion about animals. I am a vegetarian today, but I had to learn the hard way, I suppose. Yeah. Um, let me Let me ask you this, though, while we're on animals. See, you mentioned you know, the predator-prey relationship. And there is some of that. And you heard my setup piece, I'm sure. So, you know, I mean, I had to kill a raccoon or let it kill my wife's chickens. And you get a 45, 50-pound raccoon, and they don't run away when you tell them to go away. They've got a free meal. Um, Do you think that animals can understand us? Do you think that, as with the skunk in the chicken house, you can say to an animal, you know, look, I'm going to have to kill you if you don't leave, and they somehow get that message, wild animals? Yes, very much so. And I hear these stories more than not. Um, And, of course, in situations like you were discussing earlier, of course, you know, I think what we need to keep in mind is our ultimate goal and our first line of, of response should be a nonviolent. You know, how do we keep the animal away? How, you know, all the things we can do, uh, fences, wire, you know, all sorts of nonviolent uh, ways. Because what we have to remember, and it's the same as driving down the road in our car, we have to remember that we are taking up so much space in the wild from beings that is their home. And there's so many of us now that we're encroaching so much so on the wildlife, they they have so few places left to go. So we need to keep that, that compassionate knowing that they're not trying to steal from us. They're just trying to survive. And when we when we look at it from that perspective, I think we become more compassionate and understanding. Yeah, I, I try to be. I, I genuinely yeah. try to be. Um, but I, but I do you... believe that we can we can focus more on figuring out how to communicate to these beings that we don't want them there. 
See, and that's, to me, I think that's what, when you get a coon, like we were talking about, the nails are so long and sharp, it sliced through chicken wire like it was a you right. know, laser cutter. Uh, right. But, right. so we get the, you know, a fair balance on the animals before we get more deeply into this subject. When you look at predator prey, we tend to think of, you know, animals doing only what they need to do to survive. Right. We forget about animals that kill just for killing's sake. They can be a domestic dog gone wild. They can be a coyote. I have seen a stallion kill a seven-day-old foal in order to be able to get to the mare during foal heat. And just, right. I mean, stomp it to death. It's just disgusting. So... We hear a lot in New Age parlance, if you will, about the magic of animals and how wonderful they are and how they, you know, will lay down with one another, the bond sort of thing. But there's a real, there's another side to animals just like there is to human beings. Uh, Just like human beings. Is that not true? Flesh that out for us, please, Doctor. Absolutely. And one thing that I, and and again, like humans, there are different levels of awareness. You know, there are the bodhisattvas, and then there are the not-so-evolved. So it's it's very similar to humans. But I've not seen such cold calculated in my experience killing as I have in in humans because, you know, Mm -hmm. I've been in the trenches a long, long time. And particularly now, I see a lot of things on, you know, YouTube, on Facebook, and all these proud people, you know, proud of killing a, 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 a wild animal, even those who are on the brink of extinction. So I've never seen anything quite paralleled uh, as humans do. And the stallion you're speaking of, that stallion is completely enraged in hormone. Um, you know, that's not cold calculating the killing. That is. Uh, an animal in a state of complete hormonal, you know, existence. Mm -hmm. So, um, but it's the real world, you know, and and again, I don't like anthropomorphizing animals. I don't like to see animals dressed up in human clothes. I don't like to see humans judging their behavior by what animals do. Every species is unique and specific, and there's a real world out there. and we shouldn't fantasize. We should never, ever try to become friends with wild animals. I'm very much against that. You know, that only ends up uh, tragically. Right. Tell us, you know, something. And I should have asked this right out of the get go. But um, why did you, you know, decide to practice abroad? What took you abroad? Well, you know, I had three lives, uh, three loves. Um, that pretty much have run through my my whole life since I was young. And I guess I just sort of came in with these things. And, of course, one was my great love and compassion for animals. Two was um, a spiritual journey, a mystical journey that I has been with me most all of my life. And the third is a, uh, I just love to travel. When I was a little kid, I remember digging. I was a bit of a tomboy and that nature girl, and I was digging in my in the backyard My father came out and he said, Linda, if you keep digging, you're going to end up in China. You better quit that. (laughs) And my, I just totally lit up. I said, let's keep digging. I want to go to China. (laughs) So I tried to and did combine those three loves and spent many, many years living overseas. um, Well, when, when you were overseas, were you practicing domestic animal care, such as you would here in the States, or were you in the jungles, or? Yeah, it was mostly uh, work in the, work with wildlife out in the trenches. It's what I found myself doing, and I sort of backed it up with some teaching work. Um, and I did do some domestic work, but mainly it was many years of, uh, uh, working with wildlife and, for a number of years, I was working with um, uh, uh, places like almost NASH units that would help animals who were rescued from the uh, animal trafficking trade. Uh, you know, there are three, again, and, and it's, I'm thinking of what you were saying earlier, it's, you know, there's nasty stuff going on there. There really is evil in the world, and it exists in the uh, wild animal trafficking trade and the human trafficking trade and in the drug trade. 
and I've been in the trenches with the uh, animal trafficking trade, and it nearly destroyed me. Uh, and I believe that perhaps in the ultimate reality there is not evil, but we mustn't be fooled into, as you're saying, some of that New Age uh, nonsense that says all is light and love. There's, there's, there's a lot of work to be done here. I second that one for sure. Now let me let me get one more, you know, background platform here in place before we really get into your book. And I think you did hear me. I do love your book. It is, I, I really had goosebumps in some of the stories that you oh, tell. Thank but you. but it, it is a great book. You don't need me to tell you that. You got everybody else telling you that from Jane Goodall <laughs> to Deepak Chopra, Rupert Shaw. I mean, and on and on. So. But on your website, unexplainedpowersofanimals.org, so you've got yes. two websites. But on that one, and I'm going to give it to the audience again, unexplainedpowersofanimals.org, you're collecting stories of strange occurrences with animals. Now, are you doing that for research, or are you doing that for another book? Well, I tell you, it's um, the main reason, and Rupert Sheldrake, who I adore and is a, a dear friend of mine, is my uh, conspirator on this, <laughs> mm-hmm. and I I mention a lot of his work. He's just a brilliant Cambridge uh, biologist. Yeah, Rupert's naturalist. joined us here on the show several times. But, yeah, yes, I love Rupert, and um, I'm pleased to say he's a, a strong backer of my book and my work. And so we get up to some mischief together. And the point <laughs> of collecting stories is. Everywhere I go, I mean, as far back as I can remember, people apologize. They, people love to tell me their animal stories, and um, but then they always say, well, I can't tell anybody, or I think I'm crazy, or do you think I'm crazy? So they open to me. The point is, in my life experience and in Rupert's life experience, is these, quote, unexplained stories happening, psychic phenomena intuitive connections with animals are actually normal. They are not paranormal, but our materialist dogmatic science is still saying this is all crazy. Well, in fact, Rupert and I believe it's not. It's, it's, so we're trying to prove what they are saying is paranormal is really normal. And it's paranormal not to have these intuitive, unexplained stories. So there's a whole collection and the stories are wonderful. And so for right now, that is that is what I'm doing. I am putting those together and sharing and uh, speaking on them. So for our entire audience out there, if you have an animal story, and if you have animals, you probably have many animal stories, go to um, that website, unexplainedpowersofanimals.org, one word, and uh, help out with this. I think that's a great yeah. idea, uh, if for yeah. no other reason that it does begin to, you know, break through and make it possible for people to honestly expect what they get out of their animals as opposed to find it so unusual. Yes, because it truly is not un- unusual. And I have a whole chapter in the book about um, all the research and the stories of that psychic connection with animals. You know, there is a there is a com- compelling body of evidence out there that suggests human minds connect not only with each other, but with animals across space and time. So we're all opening to this. And for me, it's been my normal experience throughout my life. But people really and truly are opening, and it's not that hard to connect. It's easier, actually. It's more about unlearning learning you know when we come back and we have another break coming up on us i'm going to ask you more about that science but the subtitle to your book is most interesting learning from the spiritual lives of animals so now we've had some animal communicators on this show and i know you don't really like that term we can talk about that also but indeed in our last show which was a repeat of one of the favorites here kim sheridan spoke about animals in the afterlife. Uh I'm going to ask you when we get back, how does a scientist, you're the scientist now, how does a scientist approach the notion of animal afterlife 
including their spiritual lives. I mean, that seems to me to take a lot of moxie to say, I'm going to tell you about an animal's spiritual life as a scientist. <laughs> that will be your question when we okay. come back, Dr. Bender. Okay. Uh, all right. If you'd like to know more, again, about Dr. Linda Bender and her book, Animal Wisdom, uh, be sure to visit her website, lindabender.org. Now, we have a video for you during the break of our guest discussing our relationships to animals. You can check it out by joining the chat room. Just go to provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. We'll be right back. You're listening to Provocative Enlightenment with Elton Taylor. What is one thing you wish you could change about yourself? What if you could make that change happen with the click of a button? With Intertalk, Eldon Taylor's patented and scientifically proven and effective technology, change begins to happen the moment you hit play. Intertalk works by priming how you talk to yourself and when your inner self-talk aligns with your outer goals. Anything becomes possible. Visit www.intertalk.com to find your towel today. Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Eldon Taylor. Will there be banjo in heaven? Are you sure? Thank y'all for supporting the music. Around on all the faces and I see all of God's people looking back at me. Rich, poor, it don't matter, all the same. Everybody's hungry in a different way. We're calling and crying and kicking and screaming and dying for the rhythm. Really what the world is love, is love. Love and only love, a little love from my love. Sometimes all it takes is just a smile What a concept To change somebody's weather Chase the clouds out of their sky Well, sometimes you gotta give and not receive Sometimes you gotta live what you believe Up in your arms Cause that's where it stands Right here with you and with me What the world is love Is love Love that comes from love A little love from love Welcome back. If you're just joining us, we are speaking with Dr. Linda Bender about her research in her new book, Animal Wisdom. Now, Dr. Bender, we just played your second musical choice, What the World yes. Needs Thou by Winona Judd. You know, hey, I have to tell you, I really love this rendition. So tell us, why oh. this song? <laughs> um, perfect, perfect. Um, I'm so loving that you're doing the music because that song, that song expresses the love and joy that animals have taught me my entire life. The, the feel of that song. Think of a dog when he comes tromping or she comes tromping in the house, tail wagging, giving you the most amazing, loving greeting as if you've been gone for 20 years, you know, total joyful uh, love. Or when you step outside and you are seduced by the melodious song of a bird in the tree, just, just singing at the joy of aliveness there or an elephant um what elephants never forget is love and i have a story in the book of uh, an 
elephant trumpeting and running over to a human, uh, recognizing that person as a keeper after 38 years of absence. So all that love and beauty and spirit is represented in that song to me, what animals yeah. have taught me. You really did think about these songs, didn't you? Yes, they are. They are. I was like a little kid when you asked for songs because. Uh, <laughs> That's wonderful because the next one, the next one, I'm going to really ask you about. But we'll leave that as a cliffhanger for our audience. <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay. Back to the subtitle of your book, uh, "Learning from yes. the Spiritual Eyes." Now, like I said before the break, where does a scientist? learn about the spiritual nature of animals. I mean, uh, you, uh, Right. Well, you know, you know, anthropologists have shown through studies that all children have an understanding and just a, a, a knowing that animals are individual souls, animals are equals, animals are great beings. This is taken for granted. It's taken for granted in indigenous cultures. Um, you know, this misguided belief with modern post-industrial religions and societies that animals are lesser beings, that their neural networks firing, incapable of feelings or emotions. Well, maybe they have a few feelings, but that's about it. This is, this is not based on truth or represented in, um, indigenous cultures and young children as I as, as I was mentioning you know people who think that animals are merely nothing more than a, a Darwinian struggle for survival this only takes hold among people who really don't know animals personally and have not had those personal sacred relationships um, you know this is part of the result of ignorance um, in our society and People are motivated to continue believing it because it serves the purposes of our culture. How do you answer this, though? Now, and again, this is devil's advocate from a science standpoint. We can watch children, uh, small infants, and we can create a puppet, um, a sock puppet. Or we can take a teddy bear and animate it, and they're convinced it's alive. Yeah. We can talk to a philosopher, especially one who studied religion, and he'll tell us that the first religions were animism. Absolutely. So if, you know, if I was running through the forest and I tripped on a log, uh, well, the log intended to trip me. Everything is animated in a primitive mind. We have uh, anthropological research that shows us, you know, Tropriand Islanders, uh, when, when first, uh, you know, discovered for all intent and purposes, had many of these same animistic beliefs. Yes. So a scientist could well look at you and say, now, doctor, uh, aren't you stepping over a little bit when you call it science to say that just because children find animated, you know, um, uh -huh. objects to have souls or spirits that indeed we can, you know, say all things they find to have souls or spirits have souls or spirits? Well, consider this, the word animal, anima. Anima means soul. And yeah, but a lexographer would just say that that... that that's an outgrowth of the philosophy of, you know, animism. I mean, the, the very right. earliest beliefs that we had and the foundations of our language, which articulated those early beliefs, yeah. would have yeah. conflated that idea. So, and, and I'm, you know, I don't mean to, I guess where I'm going here is I yeah. would love for someone uh -huh. to lay down the hard science that says, without a doubt, there is a spiritual life that animals participate in. You know, there's well, some way, and as close right. as I know that they come to that is we seem to have some evidence that perhaps they experience the like kind, I should say, to an NDE that human beings have. Yes. Um, yes. But, well, you know, there's so many directions, there's so many ways I could begin to address, but one please. thing that just comes to mind right now is we're continuing to... Um, you know, our, 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 our striving to 
say that animals are, or prove that animals are lesser than us keeps failing, you know, in so many different ways. Um, Dean Radin has amazing, amazing sti- studies. Um, Russell Targ has amazing studies. And, of course, and I know Rupert's I know work. both of them. And, and, yeah. And, and there we're talking about, you know, consciousness as not being a local event. Right. And animals okay. have consciousness you know, different levels of consciousness as we do. I, I, you see, I, my whole life I have never had a struggle with my scientist brain and my uh, spiritual, mystical brain. They simply have not caused a dilemma for me because they live together. And particularly, I'm not going to go on about quantum physics, as so many people do, but I actually have a son who is, an, uh, you know, an, uh, a young... A physicist, a quantum physicist, and he de- specializes in light, and we have these discussions. And when you speak to people like that who are truly doing the work in science, in physics, they really are, they're living the questions, not answers, that we really don't know. There's right. so much more that we don't know than we do know. It reduces us, and it reduces science when we don't simply open to the possibility, you know. But, for example, one science has recently shown evidence that elephants, and we all love our elephant stories, they have so many similar qualities to us emotionally and uh, great love and compassion they share with each other. They recently were shown, scientifically shown, that they, they have uh, what's called mirror recognition. So mm-hmm. when an elephant looks into the mirror, they they have proven that that elephant understands that that's them, and they'll self-image, be right? Up and they'll touch the mirror, and they'll understand that it's that it's self recognition. And what I find interesting is that quote science thinks that that's a requisite or a prerequisite to the ability to have a spiritual life. So why, from what, from what um, self serving uh, dogmatic, whatever, would you say, why would you deny that that animal must no, not I, have a I totally role? concur with you. I, I think, yeah. you know, I think the evidence, um, you know, like yourself, uh, my son is a physicist at the University of Washington, uh, and I have a niece that uh, has her PhD in physics from Cambridge. So, we're we're surrounded in in science, and they are. And I love how you put it. They are living the question. Yeah. Uh, some of them, you know, square one way, and some square another way. I think the bottom line is this. And and please correct me if if I'm wrong. We don't really, we can't really scientifically say that there is an afterlife for human beings. We right. have a good deal of of information that suggests that, but, you know, there's also data that would argue against it. But if if conscious beings, such as human beings, do indeed have a spiritual life, and I believe they do, and obviously you do, then animals must also, because they share the qualities of consciousness. That That's how I interpret what you're telling me. Is that, yes, that yes, fair? Yes, and... Think about it, and even when we connect uh, intuitively with animals, um, and, and we so many people want to communicate with our animals, but, you know, I say, let's start by thinking, remembering that the same thing that makes an elephant, a dog, a bird alive, makes us alive. It, it cannot be, again, otherwise. We're all made of the same stuff. We all come from the same, same source. Why would we deny that? Why would we close that possibility down in the first place, other than for that egoic desire to prove, you know, uh, some kind of, uh, of dominion over another? I did a, an interview with, with Deepak Chopra, and mm-hmm. we were going over some of these questions, and he, he asked me, he said, well, what's your bottom line? You know, where, where do you draw the line of what has soul and what doesn't have soul? And I said, Deepak, I don't draw the line. I believe that all life is soul. Why would it be otherwise? 
See, see, Ahimsa. I, I, I totally agree. And, and, and yeah. indeed, let me ask you this: since, since you're right there on the edge of that, and you know, kind of, well, there are philosophies, religions, uh, who find plant life to be um, inhabited by spirit as well. Uh, what, what is your thought about that? Well, again, I think all life, you know, we're all energy and information. There's no cutoff point where this is alive and this is dead. You know, and mainstream science has said we're, we happen to be the only ones with consciousness that are alive. The rest of the universe is dead. Well, we're finally beginning to realize that that's not true. That's false effect, right? <laughs> Even science is showing that. Talk to your son or, or you know, my son or any of these people yeah. who are living these questions. So I think we're we're slowly coming to the realization that that there is no division. You know, all life is sacred. All life is, and I believe, and it has been my life experience, and that's what I teach. I don't teach dogma. I only teach what I have learned uh, in my own life and my own experience. And one, that's one reason I resonate with St. Francis because I think St. Francis is a human being who totally lives those principles and, and lives the understanding uh, that we're all one with with all life and all creation. I, I love your approach. Let me, you know, uh, let me see if I can be sure that I understand this, because I think it's an important one. To do that, I want you to think about the Eskimos. And, um, and actually, I... Uh, Inuits uh, change that to what's uh, acceptable today. Think of the Inuit population and um, areas where, for all intent and purposes, nothing grows. Their survival is totally dependent upon animal life. Uh, and then think of the Native American and the buffalo hunts and the uh, the sacred way at which um, these animals were killed and blessed and treated, etc. Yeah. And my question is this, you know, as you said earlier, <clears throat> there's no life without death. And we all, your words again, we're all energy information, period. And whether we're a plant, uh, an apple on a tree, or a mm-hmm. buffalo, or a, a sea lion, <clears throat> It seems to me that it is how you harvest that makes all the difference in the world. Um, Have I got that right, or would you see that differently? Well, I believe, I do agree completely with what you're saying, but because there's so many of us, um, we cannot sustain you know, what the way we're doing things. It, 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 that has to change. But Totally, yeah. Again, you know, in, I'm suddenly thinking of uh, Bob Randall, who is the um, Australian Aboriginal elder, and he talks about these things, you know, that, you know, the sacredness of the desert and how uh, a Westerner without the knowledge, the Aboriginal knowledge, would come to these desolate places and say, there's nothing here. How do you survive? How did your people survive? And he gave an example of taking this one uh, corporate man, and he said, look, and he bent to, bent down to the sand, and he showed him tiny little roots provided water and how to trail for life here and follow an animal or whatever. But so it was a simple life, but it was every single thing was sacred. Even if they they killed a bird to eat, that bird was shared. A tiny little bird was shared be, between four people because of its sacredness and presence. Right. There was no, uh, it was all sacred. All life is alive and sacred. It's quite different than uh, time to run to McDonald's and grab my uh, Big Macs, isn't it? <clears throat> quite well, different. you know, animals taught me to perceive the connectedness of all living things and to experience that joy of that connectedness. And the other thing that we have to remember that animals can teach us is accepting the limits of our own understanding and relaxing into the mystery of existence, that we simply don't have the answers to these questions. And that's why I love these young physicists, because there's 
how can they think otherwise? And, oh, my God, we don't have the equipment to understand. We have to become more comfortable in the unknown and in the mystery of yeah. life. Yeah, let me ask you, Doctor, it, it's been my experience that people who um, actually change their lives based on what they learn or their interactions or maybe reading a book like your book, that they develop a kind of empathy. Um, they see an animal hurt and they actually feel that hurt. You know, it's that yeah. grabs you in the stomach, you know, kind of thing. Um is it is is empathy evidence maybe even more so than the animation that a child might see in something of our connectedness to animals? Yes, and I think I can I can again speak from my own personal experience because I came into the world. Uh, my gifts are not just loving animals, but um, I have an empathic connection to them, uh, which. I remember once my father, is again, a young girl, he took me to a zoo because he knew how much I wanted to see animals, and he said, we're going to go see a wild, wild animal. We're going to go see them. And he took me, and we went to a zoo. I don't know what it was, but I approached, we approached a cage, an iron bar cage. It was about maybe no more than 15 feet by 10 feet. And pacing there, the closer I got to that cage, pacing inside was the most astonishingly gorgeous black panther with these blazing yellow eyes looking over and I became hysterical and I started screaming and saying to my dad get her out of there get her out of there she's Mm -hmm. so angry she's so upset she's fearful get her out of there she wants to be free my poor father you know we had to leave I was inconsolable but again um that was a totally empathic connection to what was going on in this being. And well, uh, that, go ahead. I guess uh, it's tough when you when you can do that. So what, what do you tell some I mean, you just <laughs> flooded my mind with experiences, but, you know, I used to have a rather large flock of white racing homer pigeons. They were gorgeous. They'd go up and circle and fly the neighborhood. I mean, and, and it was 50-some-odd birds. But they attracted the hawks, and one day the hawks came in, and they killed several. I mean, they just killed them. They they weren't eating, and they were just killing them. I was so angry. I mean, I yes, I I, I wanted to kill them all, and yet one of them trapped itself in an aviary. You know, the bird aviary. Well, I couldn't get myself to kill it. You know, I let it out of the aviary, and what I did is I ended up selling the pigeons because they didn't want them caged and unable to fly. And, and it, But what do you tell somebody to do when they find themselves in a quandary like that? Um, except the mystery of prey predator, of, you know, you have to accept the, the mystery of it. And just, I believe that it's all perfect in its own way. That is nature. Um, it's not our job to judge, and and I, I can't I can't speak on the experience that you had there, but I don't like to see an animal, you know, taking another animal's life. But I also remind myself that that animal may be feeding the babies back in in the nest. So again, I look at it as not taking and destruction. I look at all of that as Yes, I don't understand it all. I don't know why it exists, but, you know, accept the mystery, accept it for what it is. Yeah, and I guess all those neurochemicals that bathe your body, (laughs) just, man, I can think about that and I can get angry. Well, I don't want to do that. Well, you you have been. Yeah, welcome to my world when, you know, I never, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, you know, I don't like to step on a bug. I go out of my way to save anything. And I distinctly remember feeling uh, a time when I could actually commit murder when I was working in the trenches um, with uh, what poachers would do, you know, just, just shamelessly killing and raping animals out of their innocent, innocent, beautiful wildlife out of their habitats. And, you know, the rage was... was 
scary that I would feel. You know, you, you have those stories where you think about them, and you know they just they bring warmth to you. They're just inspiring, and and then you have those the predaciousness of animal against animal, human against um, non-human animal, and it just. You know, I I relate. That's why I asked the question. Yes. Uh, yes. Mystery, you know, I don't know. The, the great mystery is think of something else so you get rid of those chemicals before they shut down the optimal operation of your ANS immune and endocrine system. There you We've go. got a break. <laughs> we'll be back in just a couple okay. minutes and we'll pick this up. The book is Animal Wisdom Learning from the Spiritual Lives of Animals. We're glad you chose to tune in to us today. We know you have many choices, and we hope you're enjoying our show with our guest, Linda Bender, and our discussion about her work, her books, and animals all together. Remember to check out her website at lindabender.org. Get her book. We'll be right back after paying some bills. You're listening to Provocative Enlightenment with Elton Taylor. Hi, I'm Eldon Taylor, and you're listening to Provocative Enlightenment Radio. I'm so glad you could join me as we tackle those tough questions in search of the answers that really matter. But remember, this is a journey we are undertaking together, so I would love to hear your thoughts as well. Please send your comments to Eldon, that's E-L-D-O-N, at eldontaylor.com. You can also join in the conversation by... Joining me on Facebook at Dr. Eldon Taylor, that's D-R-E-L-D-O-N-T-A-Y-L-O-R. Now, back to the show. Welcome back. We've been chatting with Dr. Linda Bender about her life, work, and new book, Animal Wisdom. In this half hour, we're going to take your calls, so if you have questions, give us a call or advance your comments and questions in our chat room. And remember, I love your comments and feedback, and a great place for that is on Facebook, so I invite you to join me there. All right, Dr. Bender, we just played Behind That Locked Door by George Harrison. And I'm really curious about this one. What's behind the locked door? Well, that song always brings tears to my eyes. Uh, I love the music of George Harrison. I always have. And on the cover of my book is the picture of my dog, Pepper. I didn't put that picture on the cover. Um, Random House said, this will be your cover. (laughs) Uh, But my dog, Pepper was 15 years old when he he died he passed over 
And several years before, when I was writing the book, he never left my side. And my life imploded uh, a bit, more than a bit at the time. And when I was finishing the book, I would look at Pepper and say, you can't leave me, you can't leave me. Until I finish the book, you have to stay with me, because he was developing some chronic problems. And and what happened, when I finished writing the book, I was sending the manuscript off to the publisher, and I held it up, and I looked at Pepper, and I said, we did it, baby, we did it. And it was a week later that he ended up dying in my arms. And I took his body to my friend's clinic, and I was going to have him cremated. And on the drive back from my friend's clinic, this song came on the radio. And I never in my life, in a lifetime of connecting with animals, felt the presence of my pepper so strongly as I did through the words of that song. And what he was telling me is he was gone now, but he was still with me in spirit. And I needed to be strong because behind the locked door was the heart that I had closed to humans. And he was reminding me that I needed to come out more fully into the world. Now was the time. He couldn't be with me anymore. But now was the time to step out into that arena and love the humans and unlock that compassion and love for humanity as I did for animals. And I ended up going to South Africa for two weeks and working with the uh, San people in the Kalahari Desert and the Sangomas, and they gave me the confirmation of that exact same message. Wow. I'm holding the book in my hands as you tell that story, looking at your uh, German short hair. He's a mix. Uh, he was a shelter mix. He's got a little bit of everything in him beautiful dog but you can see how you're looking at the dog the love that you must have for him yes and yes. still do and still do and that's one thing that people really resonate in my book it's about what animals have to teach us about death and dying you know in our culture we just seem to shove it under the rug we you know we deny death and you know we fight it we argue it we push it away we do everything we can but it's so much a part of life. Um, and animals, because of their shorter lifespans, are often our first experience with death and dying. And they have so, so much to teach us about the process. Tolstoy said you can't live until you've reconciled dying, and I totally agree with that. Absolutely. Uh, but, you know, losing... Uh, an animal, as you well know, losing your friend, someone that close to you, is uh, very, very difficult and uh, tends to cause a lot of people not to want to have another uh, animal. Um, yes. And and that, uh, you know, that's, that's a part of the mourning process. And uh, as you right. say, that is a part of recognizing the cycle of life. Um, right. You got yourself another dog, Doctor. Well, actually, I did. I very recently, and uh, I I kept missing out. You know, and I kept looking for one. I said, "Well, it has to be small because I'm traveling constantly. It has to be this." And I've never actually had a small dog before, uh-huh. but it wouldn't be fair to get a big one. So, to make a long story short, I did find a little a little puppy. And at one point, I was I was frustrated because. Nothing was working out, and I, I remember saying to Pepper, I said, Pepper, can't you help me out here? Can you come back? <laughs> and, and Maybe was, Pepper did. Well, it was very strange because I was feeling quite uh, a lot of despair that, oh, see, I can't even do this right. You know, it's not working. I can't find a, a, a pet even if I'm alone. And a friend I hadn't heard from, from for two years, out of the blue, uh, there was a text that came to me, and the text was simply, look what I found, and it was a picture of Pepper sitting on a bar stool, <laughs> <laughs> staring, and I went, oh, my God, it was as, as if Pepper was saying, stop fretting, I'm on it, 
you know, someone's coming. And it wasn't too long after that that a friend of a friend said, oh, my gosh, there's a pup that needs a home. And that is my new puppy, Luna. And I, I rescued her, brought her home on an airplane. And when I brought her into my kitchen, I sat down on the floor and I just burst into tears because it was that final, and this was you know almost two years later, but it was that final door slamming that Pepper wasn't coming back and this dog was, was coming in to, quote, replace Pepper. And I, I just fell on the floor crying and this little dog, this little puppy, 16 weeks old, came over and jumped on my belly and just sat there. Uh-huh. Oh, cool. And I said, you know what? I don't know what Pepper had to do with this, but I'm absolutely in love and thrilled and grateful that this little new being is in my life. You, you know, I have to share something with you. Um, two years ago, I had to put down a German Shepherd who was in the prime of his life. Um, oh. Had lymphoma at five, was diagnosed with lymphoma at five, and we, mm. you know, took him for chemo. The chemo was really hurting him more than helping him. I backed him off of that. I found a, a, a non conventional, uh, naturopathic veterinarian, and uh, with treatments, etc., we thought we had it under control. We had it reversed for a year. He just was great. And then one day, downhill like overnight. Mm-hmm. And I ended up having to put him down. And uh, it, was, it was so hard. I, that's, that's it. I'm not going to have another. I'm just not getting another dog. And, uh, and my wife and my son were after me. And for two years, they were both. You know, isn't it time for you to get another dog? Now, we have other dogs, but I've always had a mm-hmm. German Shepherd. Mm-hmm. And uh, I told them, you know, listen, if uh, if... Chief, that was the dog's name. If Chief wants me to get another dog, he'll tell me somehow, you know, maybe in a dream or something. <clears throat> then one evening I have a dream, and in this dream there's this sable-colored dog, and uh, it's following me everywhere, and someone is speaking to me, this is your dog, It's you see how it's bonded with you, see how it's going away from food, da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was very very specific very you know so when i woke up the next morning i told my wife what is you know about this dream is a silly kind of dream this sable dog da 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 so my wife gets in the newspaper and here is an ad that says east german registered german shepherd sable dogs Mm -hmm. now i've never seen the word sable in an ad so that you know when she brings it to me okay look i'll call on it but you know i'm I've always liked the black saddle dogs, da da da. I call, we go over to the woman's home. She happens to be a minister. And uh, there's several puppies, but there's only one puppy that pays any attention to us. And it's this sable colored dog. And it's a female. And I'm not going to get a female. And it's stuck to me and my son. Doesn't matter where we go. The others pay no attention. It's identical to the dog in the dream. Oh. Well, the long story, you know, I ended up getting this dog, and, and the dog is now black, if you would believe it, everything uh-huh. I would I would have bought. But, you, you know, I do think that uh, our animals, our animal friends, communicate to us across great distances, including from the other side, just as yeah. our human friends do. But Absolutely. that brings me to this question. Years ago, I talked to Julian Jaynes at Princeton about his book, The Origin of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. If you're not familiar with him, it was his philosophy, his theory, that voices, unspoken voices, used to orchestrate our societies. That is, we would hear voices in our head. We would think of this as telepathy today. Or, you know, you might think of it as some form of schizophrenia, but it wasn't an illness. It wasn't a disease. We would hear the voices in our head from our leaders, etc., giving us direction. And according to Jane's, this is what fed the oracles, the, the so-called great oracles. Yes. Uh, yes. So I, I've always found that to be a really interesting underlying theory when it comes to thinking about having a natural 
propensity or ability to develop a telepathic communication with another human being, let alone with an animal. What do you think of that idea? How do you think, what undergirds the what we see, what you call telepathy, uh, in your opinion? Well, it has been my experience my life experience, and it's been Rupert Sheldrake, again, who, who concurs that the whatever scientific stuff we've done, we show that these intuitive connections happen, you know, people following their owner's home, people, I mean, the stories are, are amazing. Uh, in Rupert's book, you know, Dogs That Know When Their Owners Are Coming Home, they're, they're going to the door. What is it that the that, that, igniting all this There's, it's happened so much and in my opinion and in his and and I, I really believe that you know the gps it's the emotional connection it's the emotional bond and it's love you know compassion is really just another word for love so it's a deep loving the power of love in my life experience it's the power of love that runs the universe so the power of love is behind uh, telepathic abilities. Is that in what I In my experience, this is true. Now, obviously, there are, you know, it happens. In other words, different levels of consciousness are very subtle. And when you convince yourself that you cannot communicate on these levels, you don't. But when you allow mystery to unfold, which is what animals help us, learn and understand we accept that yes this is truth this is reality and you stop denying it and you let go of your monkey mind and you shut up and you pay attention and listen you begin to understand that it's quite easy to have these experiences and it is natural and i believe that these voices quote or or understandings are very real so it's slipping into that consciousness based in a love and a trusting that allows it it's allowing and again i think it's more unlearning uh rather than learning it's allowing okay in your book chapter seven one of my favorite chapters you um, you provide 18 steps to how we can connect telepathically with animals right they're very Um, easy very simple things we we got to get out of the mind and just you know Get into the well, body. Flesh that out a little bit. Unpack it a little bit. N- not necessarily all 18 steps, but, you know, if, if love seems to be the step, what do we need these other 18 for? What do they do? Well, they just, whatever resonates. You know, everyone is different. Every single person has their unique story, their unique gifts, their, their talents, um, and their own way of going inward. And that's one of the reasons I love St. Francis' teaching so much. Francis used to say, uh, when the monks would come to him, they'd say, teach me, teach me what to do. I, and Francis would literally throw ash at them, at their heads, and say, no, 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 you don't, you don't, you can't do this through me. You, we're all ash. We're, we're, we're really not even here. We're nothing but ash. You must only use me as a keyhole. I am like a keyhole through which you can look to see your own, your own sacredness, your own journey, your own gifts, your own treasures. So it's, any technique is simply a keyhole through which people can go in and have their own personal experiences. And it, you know, what resonates with one may not resonate with another. But they're very, very simple ways that people can just reconnect basically to to the source of all and that's by starting to calm down go within and when we begin to open that experience within our own hearts we see who we are and through that opening to ourselves and allowing the source in us to open to the source in others that's when we become metaphysically uh, appealing to other beings particularly non-humans and they welcome us at that level of awareness. But it all comes from going within, into the heart, into listening and being. And it's easy. Uh, We don't have to work hard at it. Well, I I particularly like that chapter because I've never seen anybody 
actually flesh out a step by step uh you know this is what you can do this is how you can connect this is and it and it makes a lot of sense and uh, yeah and they're very and simple and it, they, it really they, they all really they are. do all they all they really do is to allow people to simply experience because you're not going to believe or live what i believe or live you are going to you are going to resonate with what you experienced in your own heart and soul. And there are just simple ways to do that for yourself. You're right about that. And let me ask you this. You share a, a number of just incredible stories, and I'm going to call on you for one or two of those here in a minute, because uh, I'd like to close the show with something that's really inspiring. So you can be thinking about that. But the ability of animals whereby they, you know, are able to travel great distances to get home. You mentioned GPS. To me, that's amazing. But your story of Minosh, the cat, blew me away. Share that story with our audience, will you? Well, I mean, there, there, there are so many. I, I mean, there's so many in the book. Well, th- um, this is the story of the the cat that went 1,500 miles. Uh, I think the cat's name was Minosh. Yeah, I think that's. Um, I think that was one of Rupert's stories, as I as I recall. Um, the actually the story that I think is. I mean, I agree. It's okay. it's amazing. Te- and cats whichever have, one you want, you you choose. The the story that I love to share with people, and it blows them away so much. And yes, we we can talk about uh, Minosh as well. But the cat. Um, Sorry, the dog back from um, World War One mm-hmm. is the story. Uh, yeah. Did you read that one? I did. That's my second choice. Please share it. That's a great story. <laughs> <laughs> um, th- very simply, I think the most astonishing uh, story uh, that I share in the book is about a dog called Prince who was living in London at the time of World War One and was so attached to the man of the house who was sent to fight in France. And, of course, Prince refused to, you know, to eat, became depressed, and suddenly disappeared. Um, and when the soldier's wife searched for weeks uh, for the dog, frantic to try to find this, this little guy, she finally wrote a letter to her husband saying, I'm so sorry to tell you, but, you know, Prince has disappeared. And the most astonishing thing happened. Her husband informed her again by post that somehow Prince found his way to him. That dog managed to find its way from London to the coast, find passage across the English Channel, and find his owner among a half million other soldiers on a battlefield riddled with exploding shells. Yeah, the, you know that those. That's one of those that goosebumps come up when you. you know, and it's it's. I love it because it's you know a, a, a documented story, and and because it's based on nothing but love, uh, and that bond. I, I saw the, I saw the movie War Horse. I imagine you probably did too. Yes, I, yes. It pulled tears out of me for probably a good half an hour uh you know at the just it is a story of love and and the love that exists between a human being and an animal that transcends i think even the kind of love stories that we hear in the greatest romance stories between men and women incredible yeah. sacrifices these animals have been known to go through incredible sacrifices right right <sighs> and it's truly um about love and and one thing that that um, Rupert used to say is, well, if this happens so often, why doesn't it happen a hundred percent of the time? And I think that's another reason why we think it's so much based on love and connection. Because, well, an animal might know you're coming home, and the reason the uh, what what's been shown is that the time they show up at the door is it's been. Uh, uh, specifically to the time when the person has the intention to go home. Right, right. So we talked to and, Rupert about his book right here on this show and about his work yeah. with uh, dogs you know, when they know that their owners are coming home. 
back to your work. You, you know, yes. uh, you you state that animals want us to know something. What is it animals want us to know? Well, you know, animals don't live in blissful ignorance of humans anymore. You know, we're over seven billion, so they've made a concerted effort now more to connect with us because they right. see the misery. Dr. Bender, I'm sorry. I'm getting a flag from the studio here. We're running out of time. And I want everybody to know where they can get your book. Oh, so in okay. 15 seconds, tell us. Um, the website, Amazon, your book, etc. Yeah, uh, website, lindabender.org. Uh, the book is on Amazon. But lindabender.org has pretty much everything. You can go to my Facebook. You can go to Unexplained Powers. It's all there. Please uh, like me on Facebook and remember to help animals. And it's a great book and a great read, and I strongly recommend it. We've come to the end of another episode of Provocative Enlightenment. I want to thank our guest and all of you for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed our show, and will join us again next week, same time and same place. And tell your friends. Okay, until next time, wherever you are in the world, remember, believing in yourself always matters. Provocative Enlightenment has been brought to you by Progressive Awareness Research and other sponsors. Provocative Enlightenment is a syndicated show and appears on other networks. For a schedule of showtimes, visit ProvocativeEnlightenment.com. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor, write to Eldon at EldonTaylor.com.